Well, thank you for this opportunity uh, of speaking about uh, Sir Norman Brealey uh, and uh, his connection with our family. I think it's a very special year this year. It's just a, a century after Norman Brealey came back with two Avro 504Js as a model of them up, one of them up here and really began a permanent presence of aviation in Western Australia. So, really actually arrived back in WA after purchasing the two Avro 504s, and uh, that was towards the end of July. His first public flight was on August, August the 2nd of uh, 1919, and we all proceed from there. Let's have a look at uh, Norman Brealey. There is a bust of him, or I haven't seen it for a long time, but there should be a one out at the International Airport. Is it still there? Yeah. Yep. Uh, this is him in 1926, uh, when he was really uh, very involved in getting aviation as a, a living thing in Western Australia. And this next one, shows him during the Second World War. So he's involved, of course, in both. Just going right back to the beginning, which is always a very good place to start. <coughs> Brealey was born in Geelong, Victoria. In 1906, he moved to Kalgoorlie with his family and studied mechanical and electrical engineering at Perth Technical College. He was apprenticed to Hoskins Foundry. About this time, developed an interest in the new technology of flight, which at that time, of course, was about uh, six years old. In that same year, the English Channel was first crossed by flight, you remember, uh, from the French side. 1915, during the First World War, he went by ship to England and he was commissioned to the British Army and immediately joined the Royal Flying Corps and learned to fly. So in June, he was in action over the Western Front and in September, destroyed a German observation balloon which he was awarded the Military Cross. Now the plane which he was flying at that time was a DH-2, long way back, a DH-2 single-seat fighter. It's very interesting the way it's um, constructed. Uh, it's very, very similar to the um, Blurio uh, 11, which crossed the channel without any covering on the rear part of the fuselage. This is the kind of balloon which he was able to destroy. So looking at the uh, years later in the war, 1916 to 1917, in November 1917, with another pilot, he attacked seven enemy aircraft. He was shot down and came down in no man's land. He crawled back to the British uh, trenches with bullet wounds that had perforated both lungs and for his courage and determination he was awarded a Distinguished Service Order, the DSO, and was mentioned in dispatches in 1917 and later that year he was repatriated to Perth. While in Perth he married Violet Stubbs at Christchurch Claremont and later returned to England but he was declared fit for light duties, but not for action at the front. And so he became a flying instructor at Gosport. In June of 1918, he was given command of the Midland Area Flying Instruction School, and in August of 1918, was promoted to Major of the Royal Air Force. In 1919, he was transferred to the unemployed list, and at that time was awarded the Air Force Cross. So we'll look now at his return to Western Australia, which occurred in July 1919. With the war over, really stated, and I think this is very, very significant, Australia was our home and aviation was now my career. Before leaving England, he purchased two Avro 504 biplanes, 504Js. If you've seen the reconstructed a plane in Sydney Airport which actually is connected with Qantas. It was the next model, the Avro 504K. But the ones he bought were a little bit further back, 
584 Jags. And they were, of course, purchased from uh, surplus government stores, and he arranged to ship them to Fremantle. Brealey had just met Peter Hansen, a Danish-born technician who had also recently been discharged from the Australian Flying Corps. The Australian Flying Corps, of course, preceded the RAAF. Hansen partnered with him as his engineer for some time. So it was a very, very fruitful uh, partnership. So we look at how he was involved in establishing aviation in WA on a permanent basis. As there were no aerodromes in Western Australia, he needed an airfield on which he could erect a hangar. And secondly, he needed a fenced airfield with turnstiles so that the public would have to pay to see his air shows. The first unofficial airfield, they used the Belmont race course. There the two Avros were assembled towards the end of July 1919. This was, the, this was soon replaced by Langley Park. Brearley had the support of the MP for the Kimberley, MP Durack. This is really quite important in the whole early development. And Durack uh, was keen to see an airmail service uh, to the Kimberley established. His house in Adelaide Terrace ran right down to Langley Park and it was there that Brealey was able to transfer the hangar from Belmont. The first demonstration flights uh, were in August, on the 2nd of August 1919. And Brealey had hired the Wacker ground, five pounds, quite a lot at that time, was charged for admission to the ground. The two arrows were flown there from Belmont and the first passenger was the Mayor of Perth. The flight was actually a fairly hairy one. They clipped this and clipped that, but fortunately Brealey was a very good pilot and he managed to get away with it. The position you can see, the model there, is rather typical of the Avro 504. You'll see that in some of these uh, slides coming up. So just going back, uh, erecting the two Avros at Belmont Racecourse back in 1919, and here one of the 504s um, is taking off. You'll notice it's got a registration, it's an actually an English registration, but the, you notice it's G-A-U-C-L? The A-U is actually for Australia. They use that uh, in Britain to identify a planes that are actually in Australia. And of course later we got our own VH registration. That was until quite a bit later. As I mentioned, Western Australia's first unofficial aerodrome was at Langley Park between 1919 in 1924. So the Wacker ground that we talked about for the first public flights is shown there. The Avro hangar, which was uh, used between 1919 and 1921, was located there. And just a, a view of Langley Park, which was actually taken during a 2016 fly-in. So that was the area that was really the first aerodrome in Western Australia. I personally hope that those fly-ins can continue in spite of what's been happening at Elizabeth Quay and, and other things down that end of the, the ground in front of Perth. We mentioned the Avro hangar and uh, that's, or the hangar for the two Avros actually, that's um, shown there. And just um, looking at the various places where the Avros were taken in those early years, here they are at the showgrounds and this next one on Kalgoorlie Racecourse in 1920. Bear in mind, there were no aerodromes in Western Australia at this time. And this next one, the Avro has been uh, partly dismantled and is being loaded on board an SS Konana for Carnarvon in 1920. This is a fascinating uh, photograph showing the old and new transport with the 504 and uh, surrounded by camels. Now on this map, if you look at the red first of all, you've got the original route of an airmail contract in 1921, which was won by Brealey. It started off at Geraldton and went through as far as Derby. He couldn't have the uh, part from Perth up to Geraldton because it was feared that would be in competition with the I suppose ships and whatever else, however else they used to get uh, mail from Perth to Gerald. In 1924, the extension to Perth did come about 
and a few years later, the extension to Wyndham. For this service, they didn't use the Avro 504s, but Brearley obtained uh, a number of Bristol tourers to use for the Northwest Mail Run. Three initially, and then another three were purchased. This is a picture in the front of one of the Bristols. Jirak, the Member for Parliament, is uh, shown in that picture. And in this picture, a PMG official hands over the first airmail. It didn't start well. One of the planes involved in it uh, crashed, actually, in the, in the very first flight up there, uh, just emphasising how difficult it was. And again, let me remind you that there weren't properly established um, airfields. So the hangar for the Bristol Tourers was a little bit further along than for the Avro 504s in the position shown there. And you can see that hangar and the Bristol in front of it, one of the Bristols. And in the background is, I think that's a pump house, is it? Yeah. And I believe it's still there. I think that's right, isn't it? Now, after the beginnings at um, Langley Park, there were obviously limitations there and there was only ever an, an unofficial airfield. It was never really given government approval. Uh, government decided with the beginnings of the growth of aviation in Western Australia to find a place where they could have a, an airfield and they chose Maylands Aerodrome, uh, which was established in the early months of 1924. That's a later photograph when a number of the hangars have been put in place and so on. And also some of the, what almost looks like a runway. Of course, it wasn't in a sense really a runway, the whole thing was grassed. When we were flying there, we were flown in front of those hangars which are shown towards the top there. That was the normal pattern. I don't ever remember actually flying on that, what's been marked out there as a runway. The choice of Maylands as an aerodrome was somewhat disastrous. In the research that they did, they'd been warned that this was a very low-lying area, and this came about in 1926, when there was a flood, and there's a couple of feet deep uh, right over the Maylands Aerodrome at that time. And those of you, well, I guess, you, if you are if you're in Perth in those early days, you remember there's a lot of flooding, and uh, right around the metropolitan area, I mean, and uh, that, was, uh, that was the case here with Maylands on more than one occasion. What was fascinating is that Brearley, who had met uh, Geoffrey de Havilland while he was um, in England, obtained the, the right to produce DH-50s and to build them at Maylands. And this is one of the DH-50s which were built there in the workshops at Maylands. And looking at Brearley between the years 1927 and 1929, in 1927, he established the Perth Flying School and in 1929, on August the 22nd, he became the first president of the newly formed Royal Aero Club. He didn't have the term Royal there, it was just the Australian Aero Club at that stage, um, but it was the immediate uh, predecessor of our Royal Aero Club in, in direct succession, of course. So he's the first president of, that, of what's now the Royal Aero Club. Really won another mail contract in 1928 from Perth to Adelaide, and we can just see the, the route that was followed there. And for this, he used the DH-66 Hercules, for the Adelaide route. The Havilland aircraft were very, very popular in Western Australia in those early days. And they were used quite extensively. It's a side view of a Hercules. And because Brearley and his aircraft flew right up into the north of the state, into the northern extremities, really, they were involved in two aerial searches, WAA standing for West Australian Airways. It started off as Western Australian Airways, and then, which is the correct term really, but it became West Australian Airways. So because they serviced Western Australia as far north as the Kimberleys, West Australian Airways Limited were requested to search the far north of the state on two occasions. So here they are. The first one is when Charles Kingsford Smith and Charles Ulm and two of their crew in the Southern Cross were en route to England and went missing in April of 1929. The second occasion was when a Yilkes uh, seaplane with a crew of two Germans failed to report their arrival in Australia in May of 1932. 
So that's these two aircraft, the Southern Cross and uh, the Yorkers seaplane. And you probably know the story with the Yorkers that um, the two crew members uh, removed one of the floats and used it as a canoe. But they were very lucky to survive actually and it was only with the help of Aboriginal people that they lasted as long as they did until they were finally found. So let's look at Brearley between 34 and 36. In 1934, Brearley lost the Northwest contract to McRobertson Miller Aviation Co. And in 1936, he sold the company and rights to the Perth Adelaide route to Australian National Airways. And uh, ANA will be very familiar to any of us who've grown up in the state. During World War II, in 1940, Brearley was a appointed temporary flight lieutenant, RAAF. In 1942, in January, acting group captain, RWF, after postings in various training schools. In October, he commanded number four service flying training, uh, flying training school in Geraldton. And in 1944, he commanded RAF station in Tockenwell in New South Wales. Let's have a look at his life between 1945 and 1989. Um, after the war, he was a director of Sydney Atkinson Motors Limited Perth. Some of you will remember their showrooms. Uh, he played golf, travelled overseas and painted in several inventions. In 65, he was made a commander of the Order of the British Empire, CBE. And in 1971, published his autobiography, which is called Australian Aviator. And in that year also, he was knighted. In 74, he was awarded the Oswald Watt Gold Medal. And in 1989, he was predeceased by his wife and died at Netherlands, aged 98. And a bus by Gerard Darwin was um, installed uh, at Perth International Terminal. I want to come to the second part of the talk now, and this is um, the connection of Brearley with uh, my own family. It was only the second month that Brearley had been uh, flying his planes in Western Australia that um, my grandfather, who by the way I never met, he died a couple of years before I came along. His name was Fred Moore and uh, he lived in Fremantle. Uh, I'll show you just where um, shortly. But that was on the 27th of September. Now actually He's in the back seat, and Brearley's in the front. He was shown in the front, but he's actually in the back seat here. I always find this amazing. I hadn't, as I say, met him. These were early days for cars in Western Australia. And my grandfather actually purchased a car. He learned to drive it. But in the early days of driving it, he was reversing at one stage. And apparently he sort of went down a rut uh, as he was reversing and resolved he'd, he'd never drive again. So for him to go up in an Avro 504 with Brearley, just 16 years after the beginning of flight, I thought was pretty good. This flight took place on North Fremantle Oval. This is the Oval today, uh, looking towards the east, and if we swing around and look in the direction of the southwest, across the river, on the other side, was where my grandfather's home was at this time. He was located there because in 1900, he'd taken over the firm commenced by his father, W.D. Moore, and uh, William Dalgetty Moore, born in the colony in 1835, the year after his parents arrived, uh, and who died in 1910, had established his business here in Henry Street, Fremantle. There were one or two other buildings, but those, that was the main building. W.D. Moore and Company had a number of um, interests, but their main breadwinning activity, I suppose, was windmills. Now, as I remember them, um, I don't actually remember them having this on them, W.D. Moore and Company, Fremantle. I remember them as air motor windmills. They were imported uh, from the United States and then later uh, permission was obtained to build them here. Now I'm indebted to Brian that in the 
early days of aviation in WA, it was common to hear, if you have an engine failure, carefully assess the wind direction by studying animals, smoke, or windmills. If the windmill doesn't have WD Moore on the tail, don't trust it. <laughs> While the business remained in Fremantle, my grandparents actually moved to Adelaide Terrace, only a few doors down from the Jurex home, that's the MP of whom we spoke earlier. Uh, this was their house, uh, not quite as they had it. That staircase in the front has been added uh, once it had passed out of family hands. Um, behind the house was a grassed area and the garage over on the left. Behind that was a tennis court and then there was an orchard running down uh, to Langley Park and at the very bottom was a fairly small space where my auntie had her horse. Their family moved to 237 Adelaide Terrace uh, in 1922. My father would have been 13 at that time. So if we think about the earlier maps, 237 Adelaide Terrace was very, very close to Langley Park, which was still at this stage, of course, being used as the airport. And that's a photo of my um, grandfather. His oldest son was uh, John Moore, born in 1909. And when the um, Aero Club was formed in, the, in uh, 1929, uh, from very early on, uh, both my father and my mother, they weren't yet married, but they were associated with the, uh, what became the Royal Aero Club. You can see my father there, and my mother is here. And they're also in this uh, early photograph, my mother's sort of on the steps there, and my father off to the left. I think this is rather delightful. This was um, a Royal Aero Club ball in 1931, and they had their photographs taken here. I'll not have to walk home anyway. Uh, Aero Club ball in, uh, on June 1931. When I came along, um, one of the aircraft that I remember very clearly is the Stinson Reliant. This photograph was taken in 1939. The Stinson was destroyed in Broome by Japanese bombing in February of 1942. Uh, it was a beautiful aircraft. This is actually a model of it, but it does have the advantage in days of black and white photography of showing what the actual colours were. And that's in fact very typical, isn't it? A dark blue fuselage and silver wings. The Supermoon S6B had that, the uh, Southern Cross had that, and you could go on and on. It was sort of the, the way you painted aircraft in those days. Another one showing um, my father in front of the uh, Stinson and uh, at the controls. Now, I haven't gone through, I've got other photos, of course, of him with aircraft, but I've just, I'll just run down the aircraft that airlines had, which he was involved with. There was the Simmons Spartan, there was the GH-84 Dragon, the Stinson Reliant I mentioned, the GH-89 Dragon Rapide, the DH-90 Dragonfly, just a little five-seater, the Dragon Rapide was eight-seater, um, the Tiger Moth, they actually owned a Tiger Moth, and uh, they used to um, name things RMA, Royal Mail Australia, and the Tiger Moth was named after one of the towns in Western Australia, you and me. And the Tiger Moth actually was used once my father brought uh, about a 10 year old girl, I think, who was quite desperate ill and flew her back, and I think it was at night time. And they probably had to put um, car lights or something on at Maylands when he came back. There was the uh, GAL Monospar as well, the Abra Anson, of course, uh, after World War II then the de Havilland Dove. And when my father retired from the airlines, he was given uh, a quite large photo of the doves lined up there in that particular way at Perth Airport because uh, the airlines had moved over from Maylands to Perth Airport um, some years before. 
So I'd just like to make an acknowledgement of um, sources that I've uh, used to put this together. The uh, Wings of Change, many of you all know, it's really history of the uh, Royal Aero Club up to for its first 70 years. I've mentioned Brealey's Australian Aviator. My father had two copies of that among his belongings. And then in the Australian Dictionary of Biography, Bill Bunbury has uh, got the entry for Norman Brealey. Uh, John Good has a book called Wood, Wire and Fabric, published in 1968. And I'm very grateful for uh, a lot of input from Brian Hernan, uh, people who shape Perth, but uh, other things as well. So thank you very much for your attention.